you want to go ahead and get started? That way we don't run too, too long. Um, so yeah, I'll keep admitting people as they pop up, but we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here for the Aquatic Invasives webinar. My name is Caitlin Yoder. I'm the Education Coordinator for the Lilly Center for Lakes and Streams. Um, here at the Lilly Center, we have the goal of keeping the lakes and streams of Kosciuszko County clean, healthy, safe, and beautiful. And one of the ways we hope to do that is through webinars like this and some other webinars that we're planning for the rest of 2020. We want to use these to help equip our community members at the tools and the skills that they need to make a difference for our lakes and streams. And today we have partnered with um, David Carr of the Starry Stone Wart Collaborative. Um, and he will be talking about one of, those, one of the threats that we have to our lakes, which is aquatic invasive plants. Um, just so you know, this webinar is going to be a little longer than an hour, but we will be um, stopping intermittently for questions. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please use the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your mouse, there should be a little chat icon. And I'll be keeping track of those questions, too, as you ask them. Um, we'll also have a recording available um, afterwards. So if you have to pop off for any reasons uh, or any reason and uh, want to go back and reference something, we should be able to get that to you as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. And there you go. Thank you, Kaylin, very much. Hello, everybody. I see we're over 20 people already. This is wonderful. I hope everybody is doing well with the pandemic as, as the best we all can. Um, this is interesting and we're doing these and, and they get interesting. Um, pandemic aside, we would probably do this long distance anyway because I'm located in upstate New York and you folks are out there in Indiana. Um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, we got, you know, the, doing uh, training people to do an, uh, identification of aquatic vegetation is tricky anyway and, and doing it without standing on the shore somewhere in a nice beautiful lake and looking at stuff getting your hands dirty is, that's always the best way, but we'll get through this. I have a fair amount of stuff to cover. Um, so I'll try and get through it quickly without keeping everybody um, too long. So getting into it, this, I put this right up. Um, I, Caitlin may have already circulated this to you. This is the one thing, if you're going to write something down, this is the one to write down. Um, I tried to set it up with this teeny URL, so it's a relatively easily understood uh, web address. This is where there's all kinds of supporting documentation. Um, I tried to put together all kinds of stuff, fact sheets and other information, and I'll go over this again at the end. Um, but this is where you'd find lots of things to help you understand and review what we talked about and better identify the invasives. Um, an agenda of sorts. I'm going to talk a little bit about the collaborative and background um, about invasive species in general, uh, which may be a little bit of uh, uh, repetition for some of you, but it never hurts to uh, go back and visit stuff. Well, then we'll get into the good stuff. Uh, this is about the survey and sampling uh, program we've put together, including the Survey123 application, which is a way to record things in the field on your phone or, a, or a tablet. Uh, and then we we'll talk about identification. And we're going to talk, obviously, primarily about uh, starry stonewort, but we feel that if you're out there throwing a rake and pulling up uh, vegetation from the water, maybe try and identify some others as well. And so we'll urge you to do that. And then we'll just have wrap up and questions. And I do, I am going to make you work. I have a, a long questionnaire poll of four whole questions that you have to answer at the end. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard. So a little background of what we're all about. Uh, the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. And I'll show you a map in a minute where we are. Um, we just promote environmental research and education. As it says there, we have a number of program areas, uh, outreach, education, economic development. We have a couple of uh, labs on site, uh, do a lot of amazing things there. It's a great group to work with. Generally speaking, we're, we don't have a lot of classes there um, other than specialized you know, training classes like this. Uh, we don't do a lot of teaching for the, on the curriculum, but we do occasionally. And how's within that? The only reason I'm putting this up here is because you're going to see it when you look at some of the documentation that I've provided. Um, this is a New York State thing. It's the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, or Finger Lakes PRISM. It's easier to say. Uh, there's a website if you're interested. Um, and then, as it says, we partner with people from all over the, all over our region uh, to do whatever we can to stop invasive species of all kinds. 
stop the spread, teach about protect, uh, detection, early, um, early detection, control measures, all that good stuff. And there's eight of these across New York State. So the collaborative itself, we are funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Thank you to them. Uh, this is a kind of a new thing for us at the Finger Lakes Institute because this is a Great Lakes Basin-wide program. It's a great big area. Um, and um, well, part of it's in New York, and but there's a huge amount that's outside of New York State. And this is kind of our little tagline. We're out there just to help anybody that uh, to look at and address starry stonewort um, by looking at the ecology, outreach, and control efforts. Um, everybody from the experts and scientists down to you folks, um, local stakeholders and citizen scientists are really the most important part of this in my mind. Um, to get the boots on the ground and see what's going on out there. I just wanna highlight the control at the bottom. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now uh, with control efforts uh, and it's very exciting. It's a very high level research at um, universities and other places. Um, our hope was that when we did the, started the collaborative, we'd be able to come up with uh, best management practices from all these different states and be the central place to disperse those. Well, I got into it quickly and learned that there really aren't any best management practices for starry stonewort. Uh, so we're still looking at control. And again, there's a lot of really good research going on there. So there's a map, the Great Lakes Basin. I put a little star down the bottom. It's roughly where I think Lake Winona is, where you guys are. Um, and then down here, and then we're way over here. That's the Finger Lakes Institute. Uh, it's an enormous area. Um, I wake up in the morning and I wonder what I'm trying to do. This is craziness, but um, it's an exciting program. As I told Caitlin we're going to be talking to some folks in, in two locations in Canada at the end of this week and early next week for the same kind of training program. Notice that in New York State, New York State comes over to about here and down. There's probably a third of the state is in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so we certainly have an interest in what's happening. Um, zooming into where we are uh, real quick, this is uh, Lake Ontario, the Great Lake up here. This is the Great Lakes region. I'm, I'm sorry, the Finger Lakes region. Uh, Finger Lakes are named because they look like fingers, long and skinny. Uh, some of them are quite large. We're on the shore of Seneca Lake and Cuga Lake next to it are both about 38 miles long. They're pretty big lakes. I live over here in Auburn. This is a Wasco Lake and it's about 11 miles long, to give you an idea. Uh, beautiful region, lots of vineyards and things, and um, come visit sometime. Okay, how we built the, co the collaborative. On the bottom, if you will, it, um, my desk is way down at the little point down the bottom here somewhere. Finger Lakes Institute, we do the facilitation and the management of the program, um, but we need help. So we have a selected group of eight expert panelists across the Great Lakes Basin and beyond. Uh, that are just what that implies. Some of these folks have been studying starry stonewort for 10 years now. Uh, we got, I'm trying to get a good cross section of folks that know the biology, some are good at outreach, some are uh, good at identification of the field, um, all those things. Um, and so they help guide, they're like advisors. It's like, kind of like a board of directors kind of, but they're more an advisory role to guide what we're doing. And I talk with them a couple times a year uh, by a big conference call. Then the collaborators, um, the Lilly Center for the Environment with Caitlin is a perfect example. Uh, they're a collaborator. Um, and they, they are also many experts and top-notch people out there at colleges, universities, non-government organizations, um, all doing work, great work, looking at starry stonewort and other invasives. And uh, good idea, it gives us an idea of what's going on out there. And but the most important thing is they are a conduit to you folks. And again, this is the perfect model. I mean, this is what we're doing with Caitlin and Lily Center is just what we wanted to happen. You know, we work to reach out to collaborators, we work together to get this program together and they reach out down to you folks and bring you in and, and it just works really well. So thank you all for being here. This is just the way we want things to go. So that was it, it's a quick background. Um, I'll just move ahead forward. Um, you, know, you can go to the website and so on if you wanna learn more about the collaborative and whatnot, but I'm just gonna move on here to invasive species. In general, uh, invasive species is one that's non-native to the ecosystem and causes a problem. Um, it can cause economic, environmental, human health issues. There's a bunch of their listed. 
uh, economic, the one I always go to immediately is uh, fisheries. You know, when you clog up the, the lakes with aquatic vegetation, it's hard to drag a boat through there. In some cases, it ruins fish habitat. Um, there's all kinds of things there. Environmental, it, as many of you know, invasives just take over and they just push out the native uh, native uh, plants or, or even animals, in some cases, creatures, and uh, and just upset the entire ecosystem, which is not good. And then human health, uh, there's some things that uh, can cause immediate damage to you. Uh, and then there's impacts on soil and any, many other things. This next slide is really neat. I won't go into too much detail, but we call it the invasion curve. Some of you may have seen this. Time increases to the right. Cost increases upwards, as does areas infested. Down here in the lower left is the most important place. So we want that's where we want to be. We want to be prevention. So there's no species there. We want to keep them out. That's the ideal place to be, the most inexpensive place to be. Next comes up eradication. You might have a small, couple small infestations that maybe you can get rid of. You go out and maybe there's different methods of mechanical or chemical, whatever it is to get rid of. And this, as it says, this is the best time for early detection um, and ideal time for interve intervention. Um, that's where we want to be uh, right now. And that's kind of what we've got you folks doing. The idea here, one of our main reasons for doing this, other than just raising awareness, education about invasive species, is early detection. You know, if you've got more people out in the field looking at this stuff, you might say, hey, there wasn't starry storm or starry storm or bed last season, it's there now. Then we raise red flags and hopefully try and get it taken care of or whatever it needs to be. Next comes containment. And unfortunately, this is where most public awareness begins. Um, and eradication at that point is not likely. And then you get the big ugly orange bubble, and then it's the, the basis is taken over and is running rampant. And uh, at that point, you're just kind of managing it and trying to learn how to live with it. Uh, there's not usually a lot of hope at that point in controlling it and eradicating it, and it gets very expensive at that point. Whoop. Okay, very quickly, they also, invasive species are sneaky. They have no natural enemies, generally. Uh, they reproduce very quickly. They can adapt to all kinds of conditions, including harsh ones. Um, they affect the biodiversity. You know, they, they screw everything up in the ecosystem. Um, they outcompete for food and habitat. And I just love this cartoon because out here, uh, we've been dealing with milfoil as many places have now for 30 years. And we also have a fair large zebra mussel, another mollusk issue. Real quick, just scary slides to scare people. Um, Japanese barberry, this is a terrestrial. It's sold as a um, ornamental, very common. But this is what happened down below. What happens if it goes rampant in a forest? It takes over a whole understory. How does that bother hum uh, people? You know, I talk to people who are not, you know, they don't, what are you doing? They don't know anything about invasive species. Try to tell them, they say, well, that's not going to bother me. Well, there's researchers have figured out that when the Barbary takes over, there's up to 120 ticks per acre. And without the Barbary, there's only about 10 ticks per acre. Um, I don't have the, the references for that, but I can find it if you need it. But this is just an example of, I personally don't like ticks a lot. Um, and nobody does. So that's just an example of how invasive we get us. Giant hogweed, another terrestrial. We have the stuff out here. It's nasty stuff. I don't know if you have it where you are. It grows very tall. It's kind of really cool looking weed. It grows six, eight feet tall. But it has a phytotoxin, I think is the proper term, in its sap. You can touch any part of that plant. You get a little tiny bit of sap on you. It causes a, a burn on your, on your skin much, much worse than poison ivy. I've heard it likened to a chemical burn. And it's photoreactive, so the more sunlight you're in when it happens, the worse the burn gets. Nasty stuff. Um, this one, spotted lanternfly, is coming up through New Jersey and Pennsylvania, south of us here in New York State. And we've got people in the state scrambling to do anything they can to keep it from infesting up here because it likes fruit. And we, we pride ourselves in our apple crop here and our vineyards. And I like apples and like a glass of wine on occasion, so I kind of take it personally. It's a very cool looking bug. They've learned a lot about his life cycle and stuff, but it's a, at once going to have potential serious economic issues. And then our favorite, sorry, stonewort, real quick. You know, I don't have to tell you if you've seen infestation, it's real hard to drag a boat through there, do any fishing or whatever, or go swimming in it. And 
uh, there's very little fish habitat left at that point. So the, the overall message is prevent it, this protection and as money saved, prevent it or keep it from spreading from where it is. That's the whole idea behind invasive species and what we want people to remember and do. And again, this is a driving, a driving uh, reason we try and do these programs to keep people informed and get that early detection, get more boots on the field, in the field um, or in the water as it may be. And uh, so we you really start to control these things. Okay, that's the quick stuff. Now we're gonna get to the hardcore, the fun stuff, okay? And this is the, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about the survey program we're proposing. We're not uh, nasty overlords, this is all suggested. We'd love to have you, you know, try and do what we suggest, uh, but we're flexible. We're not trying to crack the weapon on anybody. Um, so, Quickly, this no review, citizen science can be defined as uh, scientific work being done by community level people, citizen scientists with the collaboration and partnership and advising of scientists and high level professionals. Um, I don't put myself as a high level scientist. <laughs> I'm more of a project manager, but that's what it's all about. And we have tremendous resources through the expert panel I mentioned, folks in my own office and, and the growing huge, we have, we have didn't say this, we have over 30 collaborators now all willing to help out as needed. So we have a tremendous number of helpful people out there to help us with things. Okay, the goal of the survey, uh, as we put it, is to uh, learn to survey and identify between one and five high, prior high priority invasive species. We're most focused on starry stonewort here, but again, we're gonna kind of trick you and if we can get you to if you want to give a shot uh, identifying Eurasian milfoil or curly leaf pond weed or hydrilla water chestnut, that's fantastic. If you want to give it a shot? Go ahead. If you're wrong, it doesn't matter. We're going to check this stuff. Um, but it helps, you know, all any kind of information we gather, we being the collective, all of us concerned about invasives is, is very helpful. Um, so we'll talk about this. The protocol, fancy word, but this is what we envision the, the sampling survey to be. Um, we want to do rake tosses in between one and three locations. If you're most comfortable doing it off your dock, one location, if you have a dock, you're lucky to live shoreline or somewhere else, that's great. If you can get out in a kayak or another boat and uh, do three locations, that's even better. Uh, we expect every other week, so July through October, that's four months. Um, so that works out to eight weeks. If you do three tosses, that's 24 rake tosses over four months. Uh, it's not a huge investment in time or energy, but it's valuable information. And it gets you, gets you out there. That's the point is learning how, what's it like to do these kinds of things. We encourage small groups of people, mostly for safety. You know, it's, this is a water-based kind of thing. You should always be next to or on the water with at least one other person. And also it helps if you're out there, you're getting really into this, you brought some fact sheets with you, field guides, um, and it helps to reason out, what am I looking at here? And you toss it around a little bit, talk to people. It, it helps to, it increases, it also increases the depth of knowledge in your association or your group. Once you find what you've pulled up with a rake and identified it, you need to record it. Uh, we're gonna talk about survey one, two, three, I'm gonna walk through the application. It's a really neat, easy to use application. But we don't want to exclude anybody. If you're really not comfortable using a smartphone or tablet, we will have paper forms available for you. Um, and then as part of our grant, we ask that you send us 10% of the samples. Um, this is called a voucher sample. When you collect a, uh, physically collect a sample, save it and do something with it. And I'll talk about how to do that. 10% is not a big effort either. Um, if, you, if you do the 24 rake tosses through four months, Basic math, 10% is 2.4 samples. So over four months, if you're doing 24 rate tosses, send us a couple samples of starry stonewort. Um, we're just, it's a, it's a thing for the grant and uh, just so we can quite identify, you know, in person, so to speak, that, uh, you know, identification is being done correctly and so on. Not too difficult. I will be checking in with you. Uh, with Caitlin's help, I'll have all your emails. Um, I like to think that maybe I can send out like a newsletter or something every other week. In reality, we're lucky if I get an email out to you, but I will try my best to contact and check in with you folks, make sure that everything's going okay. If you've got questions, 
Um, if there's some new information I come up with, I'll send it out, those kinds of things. So again, we're trying to keep it simple. Uh, there's not a lot. If you, if you would just do one rake toss every other week, uh, that's, uh, that's four, four, one, eight, three, yeah, eight rake tosses. That's only eight times or um, four months. Not hard to do. We're keeping it simple. So what is a rake toss survey? Um, bear with me. Uh, this is this is my arm. I'll be famous someday. This is me in a kayak pulling up a, this is solid, starry stonewort. As an example, if you do a rake toss, sometimes you don't get so much. Uh, there's a fellow we work with he's doing a rake toss. I'm going to do my best here and show a video of uh, how to do a rake toss from uh, a woman that works with us. Finally, since she did, this is New York State, but the concepts are the same. And hopefully this works okay. Today we're at beautiful Honey Oil Lake in the Finger Lakes at the New York State Boat Launch, and we're going to talk about how to do a rake toss. So first you're gonna need two rakes. You can bind them together side by side with a couple of zip ties, connect the carabiner to the end, and you connect a rope to that carabiner. And that rope is gonna be 100 feet long, and it's gonna be in increments of foot between each, you're gonna mark off each foot long section of that rope. So when you do throw the rake into the water, you will be able to judge just how deep it is. When you throw the rake into the water, you want to make sure you secure the end because you don't want it to go in the water and not be able to retrieve the rake. So you pull it out and you look at all of the plants that you have on the rake and you separate them into piles. Here I'm separating them into piles by species to see what I have present in the lake. And there's some maybe Chinese mystery snails. This is some Aladea. And that, that specimen there looks very bushy. But then we have another specimen of Aladea. The same plant just looks very different. So plants can look very different depending on where they are in their growth cycle. And then we have this one here. And this one is the same plant as well, only it's on the verge of dying. So it looks very different. We have um, a coontail, and that looks very different. That's very brown. And then you'll see there's some coontail that's very, very green and very fresh. And then some of it is much darker. So when looking at plant communities, you have to remember that one plant can look very different. The piece of pondweed there, many different types of pondweed. Uh, we've got some eelgrass there up in the left-hand corner, which is a very good source of food for fish. So you always take a white bin with you and you put some water in it. And right now there's some coontail in the pail. So you take a piece off and you set it in the water. So when an aquatic plant is floating in the water, it will spread apart so you can really look at it if you need to ID it. A lot of times you'll put a coin next to it for size comparison. So if you want to send a picture to someone to help you ID that plant, they will have an idea of how big those leaf leaflets are. So here's just another look at all of the plants. So I believe there's, we pulled seven plants from that one rake toss. There's seven plants that we got out of that sample. And uh, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but you can see that different the different ways the plants look. So now we've got another sample in the bin and that's Eurasian water milfoil, which is an invasive. And you see how I'm spreading it out in the water. I have the coin there for size comparison. And you can see that it has a blunt edge on the tip. It's got a little red tip. Uh, the stem is red. Those are some ID factors and when you're trying to ID aquatic plants. So thank you for watching. Anybody can make a rake or a rake toss. Uh, take a walk down to the end of your dock and drop it in and see what you find. If you need help ID, 
you could always reach out to your local prism, in this case, Finger Lakes Prism, and we could certainly help. Thank you, folks. So, all right. So that's a, that's a quick example of what you would do. Um, you go out and do your rate tosses. Again, if you've got three sites, you go out every other week and uh, do three sites and do that and see what you've got. Um, moving ahead, how do we, once you've done that, you would need to record you know, what you found. You know, again, if you want to just try and identify starry stonework, that's fine. But if you want to get into it and start identifying invasives and natives, we can do that. Um, Survey123 is a, it's an app for smartphones and tablets. It's free to you. Oh, let me back up. I apologize. The rake tossing. We sent Caitlin five field kits to get you started um, to have rakes already set up and made in them. I don't think they, the, the ropes are, um, they haven't been um, divided up in one foot increments like she described in the video. Don't, if you do that, uh, use some kind of waterproof tape. Do not use um, zip ties because we found out you do it with zip ties, it's quick and easy, but it's really rough on the hands. Uh, zip ties get really sharp when you cut them. <laughs> so use some tape and the tape those off if you want. And, uh, but you can see if you need to make more, you can see how to do it by the ones we sent. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, back to this, survey form. Uh, it's a free app for smartphones and tablets. We developed a form that works on it for this project specifically. Why are we doing it? It really is, once you learn how to do it and it's not hard to use, it's a quick, easy and efficient way to record starry storm locations and other sample information. Um, once we see it, once you record on it, we see it almost immediately. It's uploaded into the cloud, so to speak. We can see it and review it. Then we can export it uh, at the end of the season. We send the information back to Caitlin um, or whatever it has to happen. We have a fun little, I hope it's fun, little live map on the, on the website uh, that doesn't record much other than where you are. So if you do a rake toss, it throws a little red dot up on the, on the map um, so you can see where you've uh, been sampling, which is kind of neat uh, way to you know, get an idea of where everybody's working. It's kind of fun to see where you've been. And then we do upload the data to USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. Um, that's in part of our grant. We want to get the information up to them. So the data you're taking matters. You know, we're, we're going to record it, uh, get it back to you once we've, you know, verified everything's good. And then it also goes up in the, in the national data set. Um, so that's pretty neat. And then this is the New York State one if you're in New York. But um, so doing the USGS. So in at the very beginning, I showed you a web address and in there, there's a document that talks about how to install Survey123. Um, there's the web, web address again, right there. And in the, within that, there's this document, number five, and it's a little instruction sheet I put together. Um, it basically repeats what I'm about to show you. Uh, but there is in there, in this document, there's a weird little web address um, you, you go to that web address with your phone or your tablet and it'll go out to the internet and to, for Android, it'll go to Google Play for uh, Apple's, it'll go to the Apple Store and it'll prompt you on how to download and install the software. It's really easy, download the app and it'll open up the, uh, it prompt you how to, to download and open up the um, form that goes with it. After you do it that one first time, you just start it like you would any app on your phone. It's really pretty easy to use. Um, so now I'm going to try something else. I'm going to try and do an actual walkthrough of that application. Hopefully you can all see this. Now this is not the phone version. This is the, it's on my computer. It's almost identical. This is kind of the developer's platform, but it's just easier to do so I can actually show you rather than on the phone. Uh, I think personally the phone one is actually easier to read. For some reason it just seems clear. So you've done the rake toss, like we saw our friend Patty do in the in the video. You pulled up, you're looking at you look at the different things you have in the bin, and you open the, the app, you put in your initials, your organization name, just gonna put FLI. Uh, date and time is automatic for you. Then you get the map. This is critical. Okay. You can either do the map or you can load in coordinates manually. 
you can load them in manually, manually you're going to need like a, a GPS app on your phone or GPS unit separate or drop a point with uh, Google Maps and read what it is. You can do that if you want. But I would advise just to use the map. You click on the map. Okay, hopefully it'll open for you. It automatically is going to, if, if you've got GPS access, and this is in the instructions, it describes this. GPS access on your phone is going to show you where you are. Um, my suggestion is to not necessarily take that, but to zoom in from that. And I will just zoom in. This is where I am right now. Um, you know, a little sluggish here. Let's zoom in. This is a town park. Um, I really hope they don't make starry stonework here. But zoom in quite a ways to where you are. And then hit this check mark down here, lower right. And that's it. And it goes back and now it's tagged in the database where you are. And now I know when this data comes through, I know where you sampled. You can enter coordinates manually. Say yes, it'll open up two. Um, you can add your latitude and longitude in. I would strongly suggest, again, not doing that. You can if you want, again, but you're going to have to have a way to generate those GPS coordinates. So hit, just hit skip, put in the name of your water body. Estimate the water depth. If you have you know, taken the, the, the rope on the, on the rake, do your rake toss and, and put tape on it every one foot, you can use that to estimate, or you can just estimate anyway uh, as best you can. I can say four feet, you can do meters if you want. Okay, now this is the, now here's nuts and bolts. This is where you record what you've seen. The visual survey is here. You're probably gonna rarely use it. The idea here though is if say you're walking along the shoreline and there's a big glob of starry stone or something that's washed up on a boat launch or around the, the piers of your dock or something, say, hey, that's interesting. I'm gonna record that. You can, you can open up this app, click on visual survey and see, put in what you see. Probably what you're gonna do those are rake toss. Click rake toss, two things have opened. It's not complicated, this is submerged. So underwater macrophytes, I'll explain macrophytes in a minute, and floating. Floating macrophytes in most cases are gonna be lily pads and hopefully you don't have water chestnut, which is an invasive. So if, I have done rake tosses and pulled up nothing. You just, if you happen to hit a, a gravel section, that's fine. You hit zero. There's nothing there, which is no plants. Other than that, you want to estimate trace, sparse, medium, or dense. And they're right here for you. Trace is a handful of plants. Sparse is two handfuls. Medium is an armful. And D covers the rake. And dense covering the rake is like, like you can barely pull it out of the water, kind of covering at the rake, and I've had those the starry stonework beds, so that might happen. So let's say we just toss it in, and this is for anything, okay, this is all, all the stuff. When you do the rake toss, you pull up seven plants, this is for everything that's on that rake. Okay, so you hit trace. There's just a little bit was on the rake, and this opens up. Again, we want you to do your best to learn how to do this. Just take a shot at it. If you can look through the water and see, that the dominant species down there is a big bed of starry stonewort. Click on the arrow and scroll down, so you see starry stonewort, okay? Or whatever it might be. Red are invasives, blue are, are native species. So then this is where you look at what's on your rake that you pull up. Okay, you pull up some starry stonewort. You're pretty sure um, you got some native milfoil, which would be really good news and uh, some native coontail. And that's all you gotta do. This here is for floating. Again, if you happen to snag some uh, uh, lily pads or something, you can do that. Same thing, trace, here's the various species. Um, again, invasives are red, common, uh, native plants are blue. And then just where the dominant one is might be uh, white lily pads, white lilies, and then you you also brought in, that's all you brought in, and that's all you gotta do. Or if you didn't bring any floating in, you just hit zero, and you don't, it doesn't even open. Up here, if it's a visual survey, it's the same thing. You go here, and it opens up basically this, the same kind of thing, the same list, okay? 
except for visual, because you're not gathering, you're not doing a rake toss, you don't get the density. So we're trying to keep it as simple as we can. Sample collector refers to that voucher sample again. If you collect a sample to send us, then you're going to say yes. Okay. If you get into it and really you're excited about identifying invasives, um, you could either you can hit voucher if it's specifically for that. As I said, we need 10% of your rate tosses for voucher. You touch that, and then you this is this is the label you put on a bag, which we supplied some of for you as well. So you put your initials, the date, um, oh, 6, 20, 20 um, the type, it's a voucher, voucher sample. It's the first one of the day, probably the only one. And that's all you do. And you just want to make sure that that same, use the same information on the baggie that you put the sample in. If you are getting excited about this stuff, you can also say other, because you're just curious about what it is and send us a bag and say what it is. Just make sure you send, also label it and say unknown here instead of voucher or something like that. Um, and then here you put your, uh, same thing, you put the name here, which is just like we did here, only it's B for unknown. And that's basically it. You can put down notes. You can say it was uh, really windy, you know, hard to see, starry stonework beds or whatever you want to put here. You don't have to put anything, but please take pictures. You do a rake toss, take a picture of either the rake or when you put the, whatever you're looking at in a bin, and looking at the water in the bin like we showed you in the video, take a picture with us. When you hit this button, um, it will should activate the camera on your phone or your tablet. You take the picture and then you can, it'll give you the option to hit the plus sign to add another, take another picture, take as many as you like. And that's it. That's all you do. And then you hit this way down the lower right corner, um, you hit the check mark. And then it saves it and um, it'll give you the option. You'll see this in the instructions to upload then. Or if you don't want to use data, you want to wait till your Wi-Fi, you have the option of uploading it when you're in the Wi-Fi. So it's relatively simple to do. Um, I think the biggest challenge would be learning how to identify the species. This is what it looks like. These are just some screenshots on the phone. Um, it's, I think it's, I don't know, I just find it easier to look at on the phone. It's just a section at a time. It's, it's you know, nice and uh, orderly on the phone. It's nice and, you know, nice margins and so on. So it, it works really well. And then briefly, that's what the web page looks like. But this is that interactive map I talked about. Um, if you can see this, there's little points in the lower right corner here in New York State and up in Canada. We ran a pilot last year. And those are some of the initial pilot points. Um, so when you guys start using it, uh, we'll see points show up down here where you are. Again, the voucher sample. This is just, again, you, uh, it's very simple. You take a little bit of the sample, you put it in a plastic bag, a, zip, a Ziploc bag, um, take pictures of it if you can. If you already have the, the uh, application, it's fine. Use a Sharpie and write, just like I just showed you, write the date, your name, location, and what you maybe take a guess at what you think it is in the bag. I uh, put a little bit of water in there or maybe wet towel, paper towel um, and sealed up really well. And then put it in the refrigerator until you can send it or um, in a cooler with ice, but don't freeze it because it'll, it'll ruin the specimen. And then double bag it and seal it and send it. Um, uh, my address is also in the, all that information online, and I'll show it at the end. Uh, just, just double seal it really well. You're only going to send a bag or two. You could probably put them in padded envelopes, keep it easy and cheap, send it on. Um, if you've got like cheap disposable uh, um, ice packs, we've done that. We send a whole bunch of samples places. Um, that'll help keep it fresh, but just, just throw them in a you know, in an envelope and send them on. Just make sure you, you really seal them up and double bag them so it's not dripping with water in the mail. Okay, good pause here. That was a big bunch of stuff about how we do the surveys, how we suggest you do them, uh, suggest, you know, the survey one, two, three. Are there any couple questions? You don't have much time for more than one or two. We'll do lots of questions at the end. 
I'll take a couple questions. Hey, David, this is uh, Tony Bost, uh, and I am on uh, Lake Tippecanoe. And we uh, utilize Aquatic Control, which is a water treatment uh, company, and they do a visual, uh, Starry Stonework visual Wonderful. survey for us on an, yeah. on an annual basis. And uh, is that, um, could that information take place of these uh, uh, reg tosses, and would that information be helpful for you to have? Um, I would, yeah, I mean, any, any information is useful. I would say yes. Um, because we could, uh, particularly if, you know, you've got people out there doing this regularly, I assume, seasonally, and they, and they do it. Yeah, they annually. Do, yeah, annually. Oh, annually. Once they go out once annually or they go out all season or what? Uh, you know, I think they go out uh, multiple times a year. Okay. Uh, and it's a, it's a visual inspection. Um, sure. I mean, if, if there's a way we can get that here, uh, that's, you know, visual inspection, that's, that would be fine. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you want to try and get, you know, give them the information and download the app, they can do that. Or if they just want to send you a note and then you, after the fact, do it, you know, on the app or something, just email it to me, whatever, whatever you like to do. But any information is okay. good. You know, we'll, we'll send it up the chain to uh, USGS and make sure we mark it as being a visual inspection. I'll do that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I have a question on the chat window. Um, they ask, do you need to take the sample from the same place on the lake each time, or do you prefer moving around a little? Oh, wonderful question. And I'm, I'm remiss not putting that in the information. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, when you do your, your sampling, you want to do it as, at, at the same place every time through that four months. Okay. The reason being, you're going to think, well, why do I want to do that? Well, uh, I mean, if you're on a dock, maybe you might, you know, clean out the section that you're trying to sample. But what it can show is um, maybe if, maybe you can do two or three sampling locations. You do one, um, and you get something. Do second, you don't get anything, right? Or you don't get any starry stonework, or you, you don't think you've gotten any invasive. That's great. You report that in that, that form I showed you with a zero. Um, or you know you got a, you got a handful of them, but they seemed all natives. So that's good. You do it again in two weeks, and now I got starry stonework this time. Well, that shows potentially that the bed, um, a starry stonework bed, is spread, or maybe it's grown new. You know, it's a new infestation at that location. So yes, do them all at the same place. Um, I know from experience being out in a kayak, if the wind is blowing, it might be a little challenging hitting the same spot every time. Don't worry about it. Uh, just get as close as you can. Again, this isn't a hardcore scientific study where you, you don't need to drop an anchor and get your GPS point exactly where you have to be. Uh, just do the best you can. But yes, the same places. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I have one more question from Jack. Um, he asks that when you're doing the rake tosses and you're pulling in the rake, would you be losing a percentage of the plants on the rake when you're doing that? Yes, potentially yes. It depends on like everything. It depends on how thick the plants are, what the plants are. If you manage to tear some of them a little bit out of the sediment, um, you'll find it takes a little practice. Uh, you toss a rake out, and it's like a nice smooth uh, pulling in kind of a nice smooth medium pace. If you're too fast, um, if it's a very sparse uh, bound of vegetation, you might lose it. Um, so you do lose some. And it's it's an imp it's an imperfect science, but it is still one of the primary ways that is used to uh, uh, find and identify um, native and non-native species. And in fact, scientists use them in what's often called a point point intercept survey. Is that right, Caitlin? Point intercept survey. Um, they lay out a very detailed grid. They go out and do, you know, three rake tosses in the same spot and record it and go to the next one. And it's a very detailed process, but it's still rake tossing. So this is the, until somebody comes up with something better, this is the way it is and you, you can lose some things. Um, I have done a, I've, you know, it's like if you, if you know you threw it in a bunch of thick weeds and you lost them, you pull it up, it's probably okay to throw it again, you know, call it, call it, you know, oops, that's, that's a mistake and do it again and try it once more. Um, but uh, yeah, but so yes, do them all in the same spot. Okay, good, thank you folks. Okay, now we're gonna go to identification. Now, this is tricky because honestly, identification like anything takes practice. 
you know, my wife and I have done, you know, we're bird watchers, have been for years, and over the years, we've gotten better and better at it, you know, and uh, it just takes time to learn. I can only show you so much with slides and so on. Um, again, that link to the cloud, there's all kinds of resources there. We tried to really have a lot of resources, and I can show you a couple more here um, that you can try, books you can try and find. I don't know if Caitlin can maybe help you find them. Uh, best way to do that would be go back into this presentation, which has been posted as well, find the slide, and you can uh, look at the, the author's names and try and find it. Uh, we've got fact sheets up there. There's links to our website and the, at the Fing Lake Prism here um, that have uh, even more fact sheets and stuff. We try to include um, a field guide that we put together out of our office in those kits we set up. So um, I'll show you what I can here, and then it's up to you to kind of do some homework and just practice and look at all this information and practice as best you can. We're going to focus mostly on starry stonewort, as you can guess, but as I said before, we're going to look at a few others as well and see if we can get you excited about looking at invasives. Briefly, macrophyte, I've used that term already. Uh, it's basically any water plant related, you can see with the naked eye, growing in or around the water. Um, so even though starry stonewort is a macroalgae, it is still in the family of macrophytes. Here's some references, again, um, you know, if these, are, these are good references. These up here, Kate in my office, she loves these. Um, they are, it's by um, this, Garrett Crow and Helquist, uh, those two volumes. She loves them, just great big clear drawings of plants in them. This is the one we sent you. There's also in the link of information I've made available, there's uh, a digital version of this. Um, so if you know you, somebody's somebody's already using this and you want when you go find a couple pages you want to print them out online this is very popular through the looking glass it's been used by any number, number of people I think it's readily available and then this one was also um, recommended by Kate from our office who's our specialist this is done in the state of Maine uh, but she says it's very very good um, so some real basics now of what to look for when you're trying to identify aquatic plants. Um, growth habits one, three basic classes, emergent, like cattails, they grow like up here, you can see they grow out of the water and emerge out of the water to above, um, above the water surface. Floating, leaved or free floating, uh, that's um, lily pads are the most common version, we're all familiar with those, those are, those are floating. And then submersed. And submersed is the bulk of them. Uh, starry stonewort and a lot of others are grow under the water from the bottom up. Identifying characteristics, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but leaves, stems, roots, flowers, and seeds and fruits. Pretty much all the, the pieces of any plant you use to identify, but you do the same thing with aquatic plants. Um, leaves I'm going to focus on the most because as you're learning to do this, I found that you know leaves are the most prevalent thing to look at. Um, you look at arrangement number of margins, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. And then the stems. Stems are important, particularly comparing um, starry stoneworts to some other uh, vascular water plants. I'll explain that. Uh, roots, flower seeds, I'll talk about in a minute. This picture on the right is what I wish we were really doing. This is kind of in-person training of bins of different plants and things. Um, Caitlin and I were talking, brainstorming, wishing that maybe in a year we could do some kind of in-person thing somehow. Um, so we'll see where that goes. This is a great diagram that, again, this woman from my office, she, she did this from scratch. She did a wonderful job. And it's very simple and clear, but there's lots of different leaf shapes. Um, this one I'm going to point out, this is kind of, it's got a wavy margin. Curly leaf pondweed, if you've ever seen it, has a leaf that's kind of like that. Right, but in contrast, um, starry stonewort, it's got long, thin, uh, stemmy, kind of like a stem, you know, leaves. They, they're, they're long and thin, they don't even look like leaves, they look like little stalks, kind of. Um, all these different shapes, I will point this out too, because I serrated on the edge, like a serrated knife. That's, uh, that's an important characteristic for identifying hydrilla, which is a really bad invasive. So you look at, you look at leaf shapes. Leaf arrangements are also really important. Uh, you have to alternate. 
I want to point out that this is a good picture because in the water, the leaves float around with currents and wind and so on. So you really want to see where the leaf attaches it to the stem. Okay, they alternate. This is a good diagram, it kind of exaggerates that down here, then up here, then up here. This is down here, then up here. They're not right across from each other, whereas these are opposite. These are waving around, but they're connected at the same spot. So those are opposite. And then this, to me, this is one of the most common, most important things um, in learning how to do this world, it's called. And this is when there are leaves in a certain number around the stem. They're right next, they're all in the same plane, if you will, but right around the stem. And that's real common and a really strong way to identify certain plants. Because a lot of plants have a specific number or range of number of these in the world that goes around. Stems, I just said, um, there's a common stem. It's a very thin, thin stem. Um, it's very uncommon, but they're out, they're out there. Um, the, we'll call the, high, the, the stems in starry stonework stems, but they're really not, but we will call them for a sake of argument because it's just, we don't have an expert here to explain the details of macroalgaes. Um, but in macroalgaes, these sections, long sections are like, are like single cells. It's a very unique structure. Roots, um, if you get, really get into this, you start identifying things by roots. <clears throat> Some of the floating plants, the number of roots hanging down helps you identify them. But one thing I will say is starry stonework is anchored to the bottom by rhizoids. Um, they're not roots per se, they're, they're anchoring structures, but they're not roots that carry nutrients up like in, in the most vascular plants. So that's the important thing to know about starry stonework. Flowers. The easiest ones, of course, are lily pads. Um, even the experts tell me that, you know, that some of the flowers and some of the other plants are very small and hard to see and not that common. But again, you want to get into this. Sometimes that helps uh, identify things. Seeds and fruits can be difficult to see. They're really small in some cases. They stick off here. You can see this in the video I'm about to show or show in a few minutes. Uh, these little guys, um, these, Lower left, these are tubers. They, they're like little mini potatoes, just like a tomato potato grows in, in the soil. These grow in the sediment and hydrilla grows tubers. And that's another way to identify the invasive hydrilla. This vicious thing is the uh, seed from the water chestnut and you don't ever want to step on one of these. These are really sharp, but they evolve this way to get tangled in the waterfowl's um, feathers and animals fur and carry them long distances and deposit them in the water. They're also extremely hard and I believe they will um, last for uh, several years in the sediment and still be viable for water chestnut. So that's a real challenge. But clearly very easy to identify at least if you do see them. So let's get into starry stonewort. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background as well as identifying starry stonewort. Uh, this is a common picture you may have seen. Paul Skowinski is one of our expert panelists. He's in Wisconsin. He's a real authority on this stuff. He he's just really knows a lot of things. He's a great guy. But this is starry stonewort. It's long, thin, little stems, and they call these branchlets stick off. You know, this is as, as leafy as it gets. You know, they're not really leafy. Uh, the bulbils, then we'll see more of these. They got a bunch of pictures. They're little star shaped reproductive. Um, growth that mostly in the sediment, but do get tangled up at the lower part of the plant. If you see these, then it's slam dunk, it's starry stonework. There's no other thing that has these kind of structures on them. There's a big underwater shot of a big uh, pile of starry stonework taken by a friend Scott Brown. He's another expert panelist in Michigan. Starry story is an aquatic macroalgae. It's not a vascular plant. It came from Europe and Asia. Um, they've tracked it the mid to late 70s. 1978 might not be accurate anymore because they keep finding new evidence, but mid to late 70s in the St. Lawrence River out towards me, northern New York State, between northern New York and Canada. Um, and it's spread through the Great Lakes Basin since then. Impacts. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. They're like virtually any um, other invasive species. Uh, there's a big bed of this. I took this in a water body near us. Uh, it's a big rakeful. They're rapid, aggressive growth. They take over very quickly. Um, potential harm to environmental systems. They just push all the natives out. Uh, there's, 
the evidence is there's almost no spawning areas for fish anymore. Water quality, some say it actually might clean water quality. They might actually be phosphorus sinks um, for nutrients, but that's still being investigated. Human impacts, again, you know, you can't swim or boat and the fish are gone. That's an impact on the waterway. Obvious potential economic, you know, if, if you areas you live near lakes, you know how much of an economic driver water sports and fishing and recreation are. This last one's critical. What do we know? Um, there's a tremendous amount about that is not known about um, starry stoneworms compared to many other invasive species. And as I said, there's there's a lot of research going on right now across the Great Lakes Basin and other places about that. We're learning tremendous amounts, um, but it's not the same. It's a macroalgae, it acts differently. Um, out in the upper Midwest, you folks are, there's a lot of chemical treatment used, um, but that's, those are algicides, right? They're not necessarily herbicides, it's a different family of product. And so there's just a lot that is still being learned about starry stonework. This is the current extent, this is from the USGS NAS. Um, so, you know, when we get your data and you've identified the starry stonework and other invasives, um, when they're, um, they're a great organization, I've emailed back and forth with people, but they don't, honestly, don't seem to be the quickest in posting data, but it'll get up there eventually, and hopefully it'll start filling out down here where you've identified starry stonework. Um, so again, what you're doing is, is, is real data that matters. So that's that. Some more slides, a little, you know, a uh, little helpful, I hope, sheet here of what it looks like. Um, Nidolopsis obtusa is a scientific name. It grows up to nine meters. The stuff gets really tall. It's shockingly how tall that gets compared to a lot of invasives or even native plants. Um, again, it's anchored in the sediment by these rhizoids. They're these little clear. You can see, if you can see the, on top of this penny, it looks like fishing line or um, Carol Cole up in Canada, she calls it rice noodles. Uh, but that's, and there's, this is a good picture of uh, little star-shaped star bulbils that are attached to it. Um, those whorls, we'll see more pictures, remember the whorls, those branchlets are four to six around the stem. Um, so that's another identifying thing. They are similar to, there are other st stone warts, um, but the uh, identified, these are identified by the stars. Now there's also a species of Kara, and Kara is a family. So you got the stoneworts and the cara, and uh, those are mostly natives that look like this. But starry stoneworts are fairly easy to tell apart from them for a number of reasons. There's the star-shaped bulbils; it's bigger and longer. Um, and also, if you uh, if you squeeze the the stem on this, it'll pop, and it will pop on stoneworts and caras. But I mean, caras. I'm not sure stoneworts, caras. It'll pop as well. When you do caras. Um, they're often called muskrasses. You'll smell a garlicky or almost skunk odor when you pop them. So when you squeeze the stem and you don't smell anything, that's, that's a good chance it's a, it's starting to stone. If it does smell, it's it's not. It's another current species. That's a real easy, interesting thing. It's not an overwhelming smell, but you can definitely smell it. And then occasionally you get these little orange anth antheridiums, and there's some. They're like a little growth up on the stem. We'll see pictures of that. Shoot, hang on. Okay, so just more pictures, long, skinny. There's the, the whorls of, of branchlets that come off. Here's an up close, really good picture of this lobed uh, star-shaped ball bill. There's another picture of that, that penny. It's, it's almost clear. You can almost can't see the, uh, the rhizoids. And it gets long and slender, very, very stemmy, you know, kind of, I, that's an unprofessional way to say it, but I like to use the word stemmy because it's these long, skinny, sticky-like uh, branches, if you will. And that's as good, again, they don't look like leaves, they're just kind of, kind of there. There's more pictures, these are massive. This has come up from a harvester. It's just, this, this, this would be, uh, if you remember back to describing the density of what you pulled in on a rake, that's uh, pretty dense. That's a big, full rake of stuff. This picture came from, again, Carol Cole in Canada. This is a wonderful picture of starry. You can really see this, uh, this clear 
uh, rhizoid. It's because she must have washed this off. It's a great picture though, and you see bulbils all along it, a bunch of bulbils scattered through here. here. Um, uh, so this is a great picture showing that again. I'm going to show you another video if I make this work. Again, this is from Paul Skolinski. It's a great video short that he did on how to identify starry stonewort and compare it to some of the lookalikes I mentioned. So as you're going through the video, and you can access this video again after this training, there's links, I've got links for you to find this. Um, you can look at it, look at the smiley faces and the frowny faces that describe the invasives versus the native species. Hang on a sec. Okay. Starry stonewort is a species of macroalgae related to many native species in Wisconsin. This species can be challenging to identify, but learning a few important features will help you distinguish starry stonewort from its relatives. These algae have a simple body plan consisting of a main axis, which you could consider the stem. For simplicity's sake, we will just use the word stem in this video. Around the stem are whorls of branchlets, much like the whorls of leaves you would see on other aquatic plants. A key feature of starry stonewort, and probably the easiest to look for, is the presence of star-shaped bulbils. These are produced on clear threads in the sediment, which look like fishing line. A small number of native species will produce bulbils too, but these are generally round like tiny snowballs. Starry stonewort bulbils have many points or lobes. Starry stonewort is very large compared to most other macroalgae in our region. Notice the size of these native species compared to the nickel in each photograph. Then look at the starry stonewort. It is several times larger in diameter than most of our native species. Starry stonewort produces small orange balls along its branchlets. These are the male reproductive structures called antheridia. So far, only male starry stonewort has been observed in North America. This means that there is no sexual reproduction occurring and therefore no viable seeds are being produced. Without females present, starry stonewort can only spread by bulbils and fragments of itself. Starry stonewort is likely to be confused with several native species. The most commonly confused species are the muskgrasses, also called cara. However, all of the common cara species have long cells running up and down the stem, creating a rough or textured feel. The stem of starry stonewort is smooth. Species of nitella can also look very similar to starry stonewort. The branchlets of nitella always fork at the ends, producing two or more equal length parts. The branchlets of starry stonewort may appear to fork, but what you see is actually a long bract coming out of the branchlet. Since these bracts are often only on the upper branchlets, you can look further down the stem where the branchlets don't have any forks or bracts. When starry stonewort is removed from the water, its stiff branchlets tend to remain in the same position. Species of nitella tend to be very relaxed and droopy when they are out of water. Sago pondweed is a common native species that can look somewhat like starry stonewort. However, notice that its leaves alternate left and right on the stem rather than being in whorls. It also produces many large seeds on long stalks above the plant, which starry stonewort would never do. Horned pondweed has opposite or whorled leaves, but will never produce bulbils, and the leaves are very weak and delicate. It produces many clusters of four banana-shaped seeds along the stem, which it typically holds throughout most of the growing season. Remember, without females present, starry stonework can only spread by bulbils and fragments of itself. Boat trailers, anchors, and other recreational equipment are the most likely vectors for spreading starry stonework. Monitoring boat landings is a smart strategy for detecting an introduction of starry stonework and slowing its spread. For help identifying starry stonework and other aquatic plants of your lake, Check out the field guides and other helpful resources at the UW Extension Lakes on. Okay, that's a great video. It's very helpful. Again, you will have access, full access to that. It's on YouTube, but we'll have a, an easier way to get to it than trying to search for it on YouTube. 
Um, just some more quickly, these are the kinds of things I'm just, again, you know, we're trying to entice you to try and uh, do identify more than starry stonework while you're out there. This is, uh, uh, he just talked about musk, muskrats. Again, if this is a native species, it, you know, it's not as spindly as starry stonework is generally. It's got a lot more uh, growth out here. Um, as he said, it's, uh, uh, it, when you pop it, as I told you, I'm sorry, it's a garlic or skunk-like odor. You can't, you can't miss that. Um, so it's a little, sil you know, cylindrical. It's, it is similar, but it's quite a bit different too. Sago pondweed. Um, again, you know, if you pull up just a piece of this, it might be a little confusing, but generally it's going to be more, um, leaves are thread-like. Uh, it, it's kind of, like it says here, fan-like or feathery. Uh, it's it's much more delicate, fan-like, feathery. It's not quite so stemmy and sticky as starry stone Sticky, not not as an adhesive. <laughs> it looks like branches and sticks. Curly leaf pondweed. This is an invasive that uh, I know you've got out your way. I believe we have it here. Um, it's the good news about it is it's pretty easy to identify. Um, it's got this very de definite. Um, leaf pattern and again we have fact sheets and stuff available it's got these it's like a tooth leaf but they're very rounded tooth teeth rounded at the end you know um, as it says here rigid oblong reddish leaves um, finely toothed wavy margins and blunt tip the whole the whole there's a good side view the whole leaf is wavy with these this blunt tooth on the end it grows up um, you know on the bottom and it grows up and forms these big mats across the top of the water. It's another good view of it. Um, fairly easy to identify. Eurasian milfoil. Uh, this stuff's everywhere, as you know. And as the first video showed, one of the most defining characteristics of it is it most often has a reddish or brownish stem, uh, which you look for, and that's, that sticks out pretty well. Um, and then these leaves are Kind of blunt. They've been kind of cut off almost square if you kind of step back and look at them. Uh, th these, if you want to get details, um, there's there's four of these in whorls around the stem. And, but then each one of these has at least a dozen of these alternate little tiny spindly leaflet things. But I would go looking primarily for the, the reddish brown stem and it's kind of blunt. It's often confused with common coontail, which is a very common native plant. Um, but you notice coontail doesn't have the red um, stem, and it's not quite so blunt. These are a little more pointed. I'll try and go back here. This is a little blunter square, you know, sort of. Um, the coontail is, is more, uh, a little more pointed, and it looks, it really does look like a rat coontail. Um, Bristle-like leaves. Hydrilla. Um, I am, I apologize, I, I left out my Elodea. Um, Elodea is another plant that there's native and invasive Elodea and, and Hydrilla is most often confused with Elodea. Um, I lost my cursor, there it is. Uh, Hydrilla is really bad invasive, once it gets established it spreads very quickly. Um, the key is it looks very much like LDA, but key for hydrilla is the serrated leaves. You go like really close, and I think we send up little hand lenses in the kits, but the serrated edges of the leaves. That's the key right there for, um, oops, sorry, for hydrilla, um, these, re these serrated leaves. Okay, that's the key for those. And they have these tubers that look like little potatoes down in the sediment, and that's how they spread. Um, so those are key things that will help you tell the difference between LODs. Um, again, LODs are, are challenged themselves because it's common and um, invasive, but for now, looking at hydrilla, look for those tubers and the uh, serrated leaves. Water chestnut. Uh, this is really easy to identify, but it's a major problem. It gets established. It's floating. It's a floating um, invasive. It forms these rosettes. Lower right corner here, you see somebody holding a rosette in each hand. Um, they're kind of triangular leaves with serrated edges on them. 
Um, they do put on these little flowers, which you can see sometimes. Um, and then the seeds are, these four spined seeds are really vicious. Um, they're really sharp. They're neat. Uh, hold them in your hand, look at them, but you just don't want to step on one. Um, but this stuff will grow up on the surface and completely clog up, maybe you've seen it, clog up a bay or a, or a cove on a lake or a pond or anything. The good news is that we've actually had success virtually eradicating it from small areas by organizing big volunteer uh, water chestnut poles. And after like three seasons of doing that, each season is less and less of it, it's virtually gone. So this, this, there's success in getting rid of water chestnut, um, but it, it will completely take over and it floats um, just as a mat across the top. Uh, real quick, just a couple, this is a, this is a, a, a common, um, common uh, native species, eelgrass. It's, it's long and thin, you know, a ribbon-like with a little narrow strip in the center, but it looks like grass. I mean, that's what I kind of tell you, it really is kind of looks like grass, it's easy to identify. Um, I've heard it's really good uh, for a variety of reasons and ecosystems and things. So that's a really good native. And the common duckweed is fun only because they look like little tiny miniature um, lily pads. And some people see them and they might think, oh, that's a, it's an algae bloom, but it's not. You look closer and these little tiny, tiny leaves. Um, and there is a, there's, this is common duckweed. There's a greater duckweed. If you get into it, you know, greater duckweed's got a purple red bottom to it and a little spot of purple red on it. Um, but this is a common, common little plant. It's just cool because they're so tiny. I think, okay, we're pretty much there, folks. I'm putting this up again. Here's, this is the link to the resources. And I'm gonna put that up if I can. Did I do this right? Okay, this is what it looks like. When you get there, these are all the documents that we put up for you. Um, this is, I don't know if you use Box. It's, a, it's an online cloud storage system, um, no matter. Uh, there's, I tried to, see, let me do this. Okay, try the number one through 10. Um, you don't have to look at them in order, um, but the, the, there's the, some, a somewhat logical orders that going through them this way. Uh, it's kind of a mission statement of why we do this. Um, there's a couple, there's a flyer and more detail over about the collaborative. If you wanna, if somebody you might think is interesting, you could print the flyer, it's one pager and send it to them or, or just email it to them. Um, this overview is a little more detail. Um, this number four is is kind of a narrative of discussing talking about the survey program you know what you just sat through with me talking it's a, it's a little more detail about why we're doing it how um this is the number five remember this is the, in, the instructions to install the uh survey one two three and i'm going to pop it open here hopefully this will work okay so it's just just this outlines basically what i told you but right here in the middle this is the website you go to this with your phone be on your phone or your tablet go there and it'll help you download the application walk you through uh, the install and all that stuff it's, it's quite easy it's, it's well done um, this is a plant surveillance and id guide from new york state which is just some really good information this is a private uh consulting business they did a, a plant id booklet that we have a draft version of we're dispersing Little thing on harmful algal blooms, because everybody should be aware. Um, there's a paper data sheet. Remember, I've told you, if you're not comfortable using Survey123, we do have a, a sampling program data sheet you can fill out and then send that to us, or take a picture of it once it's filled out with your phone and send that to me. Um, this, this down here is the actual PowerPoint presentation you just sat through. Um, and then this, I can open this one, this is links to references and contact. So a lot of information in here, but then you go to this one, and now this is a link to some other websites. If you pass this along to somebody, they'll have this box. This is the same place we're at. So if you pass this along to somebody, they can still get to all this information. Um, this is the same presentation you just sat through, it's just a way to get through to it through library section of our website. We're very proud of the website. There's a library that we put stuff in. Um, urge you to check it out. Um, but this presentation is already there for that. 
um, the videos that we showed. They're on YouTube, but if you go through this section of our website, they just they just pop it right there. You can't miss them. They're big, big full screen uh, stills of the video. You can't miss them. So it's an easy way to find those videos for the rake toss and the strike stone or identification. These two go to our uh, Finger Lakes Prism website, and um, there's fact sheets, there's more fact sheets and more information there about uh, identifying resources and things that you can look at, download, or go to. And the field guide we sent you a copy of is here in digital format, and there's more links there for more stuff to look at. And then finally, if you're getting into this and you're pretty excited, and you just take your phone and take a picture of something, you can send it to us at this Gmail site. Um, again, Kate in our office is our specialist. Um, but so if you want to take a picture of something one identified, send it along, we can do our best for it. This is my contact information. Email me anytime. Uh, this is my phone, uh, which will get forwarded to me in a message because we're with COVID right now, but I will get the message, I'll leave a message, I'll get it. This is my mailing address at the college. So when you send those voucher specimens in, that's where it goes. Okay. So that was number 10. So there's quite, we've tried to do this fact sheets here. Um, tried to put two or three in each, each of these folders, curly leaf pondweed, milfoil, hydrilla. There's a bunch in starry stonewort, a uh, water chestnut. I've borrowed these, stolen them, whatever, from websites from all everywhere. You may notice some from all different states, some in Canada, a bunch, some we've done. Because um, I found that fact sheets about the same thing are the same thing but maybe somebody's taken a different picture, they've used a different diagram, they've described a little bit different, and it helps to look at more than one fact sheet, I think, when you're learning how to do this. Um, so that's that, that's your resources. Uh, I'm trying to get back now. Hang on, come on. Nope. Okay. All right. So, and here we go. There it is. So there's the, the master to get you where you need to go. There's a, a, this is what I just said. There's all kinds of different stuff. That's a one document that's got links to the videos and the fact sheets and my contact information. There's overview of the collaborative. There's all these things are here to find them. So we'll take questions now, but first, if I can do this, I'm going to make you think for a minute and just answer those four questions. You should, hopefully that popped up on your screen. Um, just click on the answer. There, I think they're all yes or no. A couple of them are multi, multiple choice. Do it for me. I'd appreciate it. Caitlin, are you seeing this? Yep, it's shown up on my screen. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a real quick, it helps us know how we're doing. And it again, it's kind of a grant requirement too that we get feedback, which makes sense. We wanna always improve our education and outreach opportunities. Take your time. This is not a, <laughs> trying to keep it simple. It's not trying to rush you or anything. Okay, when you're done with that, we'll leave it open for people to take the time. Um, if you've got questions, uh, go ahead in the chat box and Caitlin will start looking at those and reading them or however you want to do it. Caitlin. Uh, 
Um, there are a few people who are having trouble with the survey. Okay, what's, what's happening with it? Um, Sarah, do you have any, is it showing up on your screen? Yeah, I can fill it all out, it just won't submit. Mm. Uh, okay, huh. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know what to do about that. Is anybody else having that problem about submitting? I have yes. the same yes. problem. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Hey, Caitlin, what, you know, where it said, the second question was this, feel confident in going out and doing it yourself and you push yes, you can't go forward. Mm. Uh, well, you go forward, but then you say, the next third question says, if no, what is the reason? I went ahead and put in a bottom answer and it does take you to the fourth one. But even though I'm responding to no, and my answer was yes, is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So yes. I went ahead and did no for number, did a, 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 I pointed, I did a box for number three, even though it said no, mm -hmm. and it did take me on to four, and then I was able to submit it. Okay. I just did the same thing, and it allowed me to submit as well. Uh huh. So I answered okay. question two that was okay. And so I had to answer question three that I needed more training. <laughs> exactly. And which we said no, but you have to yeah. fill that in to go well, on to four. Thank you for saying that. It, that won't, it, it that. won't let you leave three blank. Right. Okay. Correct. Okay, Correct. that's fine. I, that's my fault. Um, but I appreciate you figuring that out for me <laughs> as we continue to learn yep. how to use Zoom. I appreciate <laughs> that. So I will keep that in, the, in mind. So yes, everybody, um, David, uh, we're we're on a lake that is not in the Great Lakes watershed. We're south of there, about yeah. two miles south of the Great Lakes watershed. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, are we? That, that's fine. We'll support you. That's fine. Okay. Um, my, my, I mean, uh, that question came up to my own my own question. I first got into this a year and a half ago, and I'm going, well, you know, how hard and fast is this? And you know, the, where a watershed line is, is where the natural world put it, but the region is affected. So, you know, we're pretty flexible on that. It's, it's the Great Lakes region, so you're fine. Good, thank you. Um, I have a question from Liz, which I think I can probably answer too, about getting the kits. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, David sent five kits to the Lilly Center. And um, depending on how many people want to actively use those, we can distribute them or have a few here that can be picked up and used, like renting per se. It'll just depend on how many people want to be active doing that. Does that sound right, David? Yes, however you want to do it. Um, you know, we've got, uh, we're happy we're able to supply those. And I know you've got, um, I don't know how many associations you've got represented on this call, um, but a bunch I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, however you, it's easiest for you to distribute those and share them and, um, you know, you, if you feel like, you know, buying a couple of cheap rakes and, you know, use them as a model and make your own you right. know, rakes for rake tosses. You can get, you can get rakes as cheap as like $15 at like Home Depot and things because you don't need a high quality rake because you're going to cut the handle anyway. And right. then we found that some of the cord for those, the rope is actually quite inexpensive too. Um, so you just want to make sure you, you can tie it directly on, but if you do use a carabiner, um, it's look easier maybe to store, but make sure the carabiner is strong enough. Mm -hmm. You know, a little tiny one that's designed for key change and stuff might not work. You might want to go to the hardware store and get a carabiner that's designed for actually taking some weight. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I'll probably follow up again after this. I know I sent it in the pre-survey, but yeah. uh, get another read on how many people would want to use kits and then we can go. Yeah, forward. no, that's great. Mm -hmm. And anybody, you're more than welcome. Anybody's welcome to email me directly too. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, is everybody that's voted or voted, is everybody that's, Fill out the poll done so, so we can get more to questions. Give it another, it's almost, we're almost done with the poll. Um, but I'll take more questions if there's questions. If you come up with questions later, after you've thought about what we've talked about today, uh, send them through Caitlin or directly to me. I'm fine with that too.
So I will make a plug for the um, Kosciuszko Water and Woodland Invasive Partnership that we are, myself and a few other partner groups in the area we're working on starting here. So we have an aquatics committee and we would love to have you on that committee now that you've been through this training or anyone really can join the committee, but we're hoping to um, tackle aquatic invasives in Kosciuszko County. So um, oh, great. yeah, I can send out more information on that or you can email me if you're interested in particular. Yeah, you know, volunteer, I work with a local lake association here too. And you know, it's amazing what we get accomplished and mm -hmm. just from volunteer work. And, and uh, honestly, invasives are not um, a big high in the list right now, but it's getting there quickly. Um, so we're shifting gears a little bit from what we've been doing. And it's just, it's really great getting people out there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun. <laughs> yep, something to do. Hey, Caitlin, it's Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Um, and thank you for mentioning the Kosciuszko Water and Woodland Invasives Partnership. Um, I'm leading the Aquatics Committee, and I was just thinking, I've been thinking a lot about um, us figuring out which lakes have um, layer funding for weed treatment. And, and those lakes are actually having tier two surveys done uh, to three times a year. So those weed management companies are actually doing very thorough uh, rake tosses and uh, identifying all of the aquatic plants and the extent of them um, on those lakes uh, several times a summer. Um, so just thinking about uh, figure, you know, figuring out who's having that done and, and who's not. And, um, and then maybe we could also do, you know, do some in-person training on identification because I think having residents um, on all of our lakes being able to identify these plants um, could only help with those surveys um, add additional information and especially the early detection um, especially with starry stonewort. Mm -hmm. That would be, I think we could really utilize um, this fantastic program and <laughs> basically build synergy with the, you know, the information we already have and just be able to add to it. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, because not every lake is going to have that concentrated effort, but this would help broaden that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that a lot too in our program of, you know, start small and grow from there. And, and uh, you know, the example, the ultimate example is um, Wisconsin. And this is, this is, you know, a big jump to get to this point. Wisconsin and Minnesota have sister programs where one day in August at the, on the same day, they have in each state, they have multiple locations that hold trainings to identify starry stonewort and other invasives. Um, and if they have hundreds of people, and it's just this really cool program because once a year that happens in both states and all these people get trained. So it's, it's that's the ultimate example of expanding, you know, we start with this and expanding it bigger and bigger, you know, across the lake regionally and then get it, you know, multiple locations. Um, so that's kind of a thing we would love to make happen someday. All right, I'm going to end the poll here. Thank you all for doing that. I apologize for the glitch, but you taught me something that's good. Are there any other questions? I either confused you all or I put you all to sleep or something. <laughs> this is Cindy Vata. I'm on um, Lake Tippecanoe. And I just, uh, maybe I missed this at the very beginning. Um, what is being done to try to control um, the starry stonewort? Besides identifying, then what, then what happens? Boy, yeah, that's, I talked a little bit about that. Um, control right now is a, is a major topic that's getting a lot of research, which is important. Problem is there are no known long-term controls of starry stonework. Uh, the stuff is super aggressive. Um, you know, I've talked to folks uh, out in your part of the world that uh, apply algicides and chemical treatments, and it, it certainly knocks it down, but it doesn't kill it, doesn't eradicate it. Um, it, so the, if you find a new bed, you know, if, if you, if you seem, think it seems like you've identified 
you know, a new inf infestation, I should say, of Star Store, you want to talk to somebody at the state level or whoever might be, you know, in your state that might look at that stuff, if you're Department of Natural Resources, whoever it might be, um, to get out there and see if there's something you can do. If it's a small enough infestation, there are some, there's some, uh, some success in hand pulling. You can organize somebody hand pulling and pull it out, uh, but you got to make sure you get all those little bull bills out of the sediment. Um, divers assisted suction harvesting is being tried. But the question is, in, indeed, how do we control it? And um, there's no real clean answer. Um, there's folks in, in back here near me here in New York State, they have a, a boat channel that they, in late summer, early fall, when Starry Stoneworks at its peak, they uh, use a harvester and cut it down. But it comes back every year and the harvester operator feels that there's less and less of it every year, but that's anecdotal evidence. So they they might start trying to do weighing it and measuring biomass and stuff to see if it has a long-term effect. So I don't have a, I wish I had an answer for you, um, but there's just a lot of research being done. Uh, but again, you know, having folks identify where it is and getting that into big databases like USGS and stuff helps the experts start to see where it's spreading. Okay. Thank you. Cynthia, I can send you, or it's on our website, I can send you the link. We did a study um, a while ago on different treatments, and I think the general consensus was that the sooner you catch it, the easier it is to use those um, mm -hmm. algicides. So identifying it early is going to be key to really tackling some of those populations. And, and who do you report it to? Sorry, what? If you do find it, who do you report that to? Um... Lynn, do you know, do you have a process? I don't know. I've never done that myself. The Lake Association. Mm -hmm. Okay. But on Tippy, it's already being monitored three times a year and it's too far gone for any of the things that David's talking about with early detection. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just chemical treatment is. And is that what the aquatic control is doing? Yes. The Okay, I see them out there today, so. Yep. They're treating today. Okay. There's a map on the ltpo.org website of the treatment areas. Okay, because I, I, I'm concerned that we may have it um, this year new. I, I hadn't noticed it before, but um, anyway, so I'd like to try to catch them and see if they can identify it, but. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I can I'll send them a text too since they're out here today. Okay. Great. Thank we you. We are halfway through. A, um, we're doing a, a guest webinar series too. We had two presentations already. The next one's in a month. Um, I will put, if you folks haven't signed up on by the website, I'll make sure that you guys are on our mailing list. But there's, a, there's an events calendar on the website, which I can update today or tomorrow. Our next presentation is July 22nd, and it's a couple gentlemen from the University of Minnesota, and they are looking at um, control techniques from Indiana, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, um, and they're trying to draw some conclusions towards better, you know, researching and uh, better controls overall. Um, so it might be a really interesting presentation for you to listen into if you can. It's a free webinar, you know, same, like this, you know. Um, it's Dr. Uh, Dan Larkin and his, there's a research fellow with him, Wesley Glisson, I believe. Um, but that, that'll be on the events calendar on our webpage real soon. Um, so it might be an interesting one for you to sit in and listen to. We're excited about it because it's, you know, they're looking at everything, you know, stuff that's been tried in three different states and trying to make sense of it, which is just really a great way to do things. Anybody else? Caitlin, do you have anything else for the group? Um, nope, I don't think so. Like I said, I'll just follow up with that information and kit requests. So okay, good. So if if any of you do want to get in and start, you know, doing sampling every two weeks, uh, let Caitlin know or let me know directly so we can. Uh, be ready with questions and you know and I know who's doing it and so on so you know we can get communications back and forth as needed um, 
you know, if you have trouble accessing any of this information we provided to you, let me know. We'll do what we can. Uh, do what we're here to help. Uh, it's just learning to do it long distance. So, um, it's fantastic. Glad you all joined us today. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Thank you.